Well, welcome back to our Bio 180 lecture series. Today, we're going to be continuing our discussion of cell metabolism. So just as a brief review, refresher, we already participated in discussions talking about free energy and ATP and how it supplies power to the cell. We talked about enzymes and the energy of activation. And we've talked about oxidation reduction reactions because a lot of the reactions that we're going to cover and a lot of the energy produced comes from oxidation reduction reactions. So now we're going to get a chance to see some of those actual real live oxidation reduction reactions. So we're going to start right here today with glycolysis. And glycolysis is going to be one of three days in which we cover the overall larger process of cellular respiration. So all three days are cellular respiration. And this is an example of a catabolic pathway. We talked about metabolism being broken down into catabolic and anabolic pathways. So this is going to be a catabolic pathway, meaning that it produces energy and breaks down, to produce that energy, it's going to break down larger reactants into smaller products. And later on, we'll do the light reactions in Calvin cycle, and these are going to be together. Those comprise what we know as photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is an example of an anabolic reaction. And that's a reaction that requires energy to take smaller reactants and build up larger products. Now, as we go through today's activity of looking at glycolysis, there are going to be a lot of steps, a lot of intermediates. And I'm going to try and walk you through how to understand, how to read the chemistry, how to compare structures, and see what's going on. I'm going to be telling you a little bit more than what we want you to know. And so, I want you to know you don't have to memorize everything that's coming. In fact, we prepared a worksheet for you guys that you can see here on the screen. And this is what you'll have available to you on the exam. Because again, we're not interested in you memorizing everything. You'll see glycolysis here in the uh, upper left-hand corner, that pathway. And it has all the intermediates. All those intermediates are in order. It doesn't show some of the things coming into and out of the pathway, and those are things we do want you to know and understand. But I'm going to show you a way so that if you learn how to read the chemistry and understand the structures, you will not even have to memorize those, and you'll just be able to pick them up from reading the structures. So that's my goal for today. So let's go ahead and get started with glycolysis, looking at the different intermediates and what's happening in each stage. So up here on the board, I've written, there's 10 intermediates in glycolysis, and I've written them up in actually alphabetical order. This isn't the order they occur in the pathway. But it gives us a list to draw from, and what I want to teach you to do is be able to pull out, just by looking at the names, the different terms and the order that they go in. Now as you do this, one thing you have to remember is that in a pathway, the enzymes that are acting on each intermediate can only make small incremental changes. And so we're going to rely on that, and we're going to start our pathway, and then we're going to look for the intermediate that is most logical to occur based on the name of it, so that we're going to learn just to read the chemistry as we go down. There are a couple things that you have to memorize and know, but usually people already are familiar with those. So, for example, one of those things is we have to have some place to start the pathway. Most people know, or it's easy for them to remember or learn, that the pathway starts with glucose. So if we come over here, glucose is the first intermediate. And I've drawn the structure of glucose up here. Uh, we've got a six carbon hexose chain, a carbonyl group, a bunch of hydroxyls. You don't need to know and memorize the structure, but it will become important to look at it in just a second. Now, if glucose is where we start, then looking at this list, what is the most next logical intermediate to occur in this pathway that occurs where only a small 
change occurs. And most people would say, well, glucose 6-phosphate, at least by its name, would seem to go next. And you would be correct. Glucose 6-phosphate is the next intermediate. Now let's look at this name for a second. We've had a chemical reaction. This is the structure. If you look at those two structures, or even if you just look at the name, we can see that something has happened in this reaction. And my question would then be, what has happened? Well, if you look at those, even just the name, you can say, well, glucose and glucose 6-phosphate, we had a phosphate added. And that would be correct. A phosphate was added. This is the phosphate right there that was added. The 6 occurs in it because it's occurring on carbon number 6. This would be 5, 4, 3, 2, the first carbon up there. So the phosphate's being added to carbon number 6. And we'll see that throughout the pathway of the telling us where a phosphate or where something happened based on the carbon number. Now, from here, we might ask the question, well, the phosphate, where did the phosphate come from? We know where the glucose came from. Where did the phosphate come from? Well, in order to add the phosphate, it had to come from somewhere. And in this case, it's going to come from an ATP molecule. So ATP got turned into ADP, and the phosphate got added to make glucose 6-phosphate. So in this case, we had to burn an ATP in order to create glucose 6-phosphate. The next intermediate drawn here is going to be, if we come back to our list and we say, okay, what's the next most logical thing name-wise for this to be? You might look and say, well, fructose 6-phosphate. Because it's the 6-phosphate are the same, we've changed glucose into fructose. And you'd be correct. Fructose 6 phosphate. So, when we look at that particular reaction, what's the difference? What's changed? The only thing that's changed is we have swapped places between that carbonyl group and that hydroxyl group. So, we just changed the arrangement of the bonds around those two. Many of you might remember back from our discussion in Unit 2 about isomers. And so all we did was we changed the glucose isomer into the fructose isomer. And in fact, the name of the enzyme that carried out that reaction, or its family name, is called an isomerase because it just created two different isomers. Now we come back to our list. So we have fructose 6-phosphate done. What would be the most next logical intermediate? Well, right above it, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Because we're just leaving fructose, and then we've done something to this uh, end of the molecule. It's changed its name. And so we'll come over here and write fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, as we read that chemical name, we understand where the fructose came from. We have some new terms, though. Instead of phosphate, we now have bisphosphate, and then there's a 1, comma, and a 6. So what does that mean? Well, it means we still have our phosphate down here on the number 6 carbon, just like we did before. But we now have on carbon number 1, up at the top, we have another phosphate that we've added. And in fact, when you see this bis, that means that there are two. It comes from the same root as like bicycle tires. You have two different tires for a bicycle. And bis indicates two different uh, locations. Real quick, we've also seen two phosphates in other places. For example, over here we had adenine diphosphate. That had two phosphates. So what's the difference between bisphosphate and diphosphate? Both of them would have had two phosphates. The difference is in diphosphate, the two phosphates would be connected together, one, two, to each other. And in bisphosphate, there's two of them, but notice that they are located in two different positions. Okay? 
So that is uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, something interesting has happened. We did gain a phosphate here. Where did that phosphate come from? If you said, well, we used another ATP, then you would be correct. We took a second ATP and we energized our fructose molecule by adding a phosphate to it. At this point, you might be wondering, the whole purpose of glycolysis, maybe you thought, was to produce ATP. So far, all we've done is consume ATP. We've taken it and burned it up. And you'd be accurate. This is what's known, these first several steps are what's known as the energy requiring phase of a glycolysis. Sort of like a good investment, you've got to put money into it or ATP into it and then we're going to get a return on that investment and we're going to pull out more ATP later in just a minute. But so far, we burned two ATP, we now have this highly energized form of fructose called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Has six carbons, in our next step, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, we've now used up all of our six carbon intermediates. These are all the ones that end in OSE. So if you see glucose, glucose, fructose, they all have the OSE suffixes, and those are all gone. All of the others, if you notice, have ATE suffixes at the end. They're eights. And so you have an, uh, that's a phosphate. So you have a glycerate. In fact, most of them fall under the category they have glycerate in them somewhere or they have pyruvate in them somewhere. There's one notable exception to this, eight ending, and that's glyceraldehyde. So it has a different ending to it, aldehyde. The eight is going to stand for carboxyl groups, and we're going to see, this is the way I remember it, my OSEs, my sugars are done. I'm going to end the pathway with my ATEs, my ATEs, my pyruvates, and my glycerates. My glyceraldehyde falls right in the middle of those two. The one unique one is right in the middle of everybody. And so that's the next intermediate, and that's how I remember it. Glyceraldehyde, the aldehyde ending is the odd one out, and it goes right in the middle. So glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay, so what's happened here? Well, what we've done is we've taken that six carbon intermediate and we split it. We're going to split it right there, so that's where we cut the two molecules. Each molecule gets a phosphate and then we're also going to take when we split this bond right here, we're going to take those electrons and we're going to add them to create new bonds, get rid of that, and that will create our two glyceraldehydes, okay? So we're actually going to end up now with two of these, and for the rest of the pathway, all of the intermediates are going to be two three-carbon intermediates. We'll only draw one structure but we haven't gotten rid of any carbons yet. We just have two of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. Now, one thing I want to point out, this is our glyceraldehyde, or that's our aldehyde. It's a carbonyl functional group, but this would make it an aldehyde molecule. And we've talked earlier that this carbon in an aldehyde is a really good target and so it's open to attack. So this is an activated molecule, particularly at that carbon. And we're going to see some action happen there. So we have two of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. The most important thing happening there is the split and that we create this activated carbon on that aldehyde. The next intermediate, we're going to start our next eight. And this is actually this reaction coming up that I'll show you between this structure, glyceraldehyde, and this is one you might have to just remember, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 
So let's talk about this for a second and what's happened. As you look at this structure and you compare them, you'll see that these bottom two carbons here are the same. All the action has happened on this first carbon that we said was activated. And here's what happened. We added a phosphate. In fact, that's why we have our, now we have our bisphospho again, just like we saw before. There's two phosphates. And if I were asked the question, where did the phosphate come from? Because of our previous experience, students will often say, well, it came from another ATP. And that's where you'd be wrong. But that is how this whole process works. We're going to get two more phosphates, but they're going to come from what we call inorganic, or just a naked phosphate comes in here. Okay, so how does that work? We've got a really good target right here, and we're going to have this phosphate ion. And all of those oxygens on it make it a really good attacker. So this oxygen is going to come in and make a bond right there with that carbon on that target. And in this case, for example, if we were doing a condensation reaction, we'd probably lose a water molecule. But that's not what we're going to do this time. In this case, what we do is this bond forms, and it's actually going to be this bond that breaks. This hydrogen, together with its two electrons, are going to be removed so that we only have one, two, three, four bonds to that carbon. So where does this hydrogen with its two electrons go? Well, what ends up happening is this is an oxidation reaction. We're going to change from this aldehyde functional group where we have two bonds to oxygen we're going to convert this into a carboxyl functional group where we have one, two, three bonds going to oxygen. So we went from two bonds to oxygen over here, three bonds of oxygen over here. Hopefully, based on our last discussion, you would say, oh my goodness, that was an oxidation reaction. We literally have more bonds to oxygen now. We literally oxidized it. So anytime you have an oxidation reaction, we taught you, you also need a reduction reaction. Where's the reduction reaction? Remember, reduction reaction is something that gained electrons. We're not done here. A reduction reaction, we're going to take a molecule of NAD+, and it's going to come in here, and it's going to pick up this extra set of electrons with the hydrogen, and it's going to become NADH. So there's my hydrogen with its two electrons just right in the name of it. So NAD plus is going to become NADH, and that is our reduction reaction. Okay? So this is a big step, and energetically it's going to prove worthwhile for us because we took up First of all, inorganic phosphate instead of from ATP and added it. So now we have more phosphates to give up. And we also did this reduction step where we now have some NADH. And we're going to see later that that reduced coenzyme, this NADH, is going to produce a lot of energy for us. So we took glyceraldehyde and we turned it into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This phosphoglycerate now is highly energized. It's got two phosphates on it, and it's ready for some action. And so now we convert it into our next product. If we go back over here, we'll catch up a little bit. So we have used our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and we've used 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. What intermediate would you think might come next just based on reading the order and making small changes? As you look at that list, it's starting to get smaller and smaller. You might say, well, at least 3-phospho-phosphoglycerate. So maybe 3-phosphoglycerate would come next. That might be the most logical choice. 
and you'd be correct. The next intermediate is 3 phosphoglycerate. So this is what 3 phosphoglycerate looks like, and the question you should ask yourself is, what happened in this reaction? How do we convert 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate into 3-phosphoglycerate? And hopefully, you said, well, we, we lost a phosphate. That's the only difference between those structures. And then hopefully, if you have a curious mind, you say, well, where did that phosphate go? And if you said, well, maybe we took an ADP and we grabbed the phosphate, and we added it back on to make ATP, then you'd be right. So this is a step where we actually make ATP. Now remember, we had two glyceraldehydes, so that means we must have made two 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates, each of them giving up a phosphate. So we actually made two ATPs, okay? All right, so what 3-phosphoglycerate, if we come back, we, we again lost one of those phosphates. Now in our next reaction, if you compare these two structures, you might even be able to guess what the name is. I just want you to look at those two structures and see what the difference between them is. As you look at them, you might say, well, and we're going to use our numbering system, if this is carbon number one up here, in this molecule, my phosphate is on carbon number three, and in this one, it's on carbon number two, and that's really the only difference between them. And so we're going to call this one not three phosphoglycerate, but two phosphoglycerate. And that is a type of isomerase reaction. So again, this would be an isomerase enzyme that's acting right there. We'll write the enzyme in green. It's actually, it's the type is isomerase. Technically, uh, this is called mu a mutase enzyme, but we're going to stick with it's in the isomerase family. So we've got two phosphoglycerate. These two are just isomers of one another where the phosphate's in a different position. Other than that, not much happening. The purpose of doing this reaction is to set us up for the next reaction where we create a molecule. Let's see, we, if we come back over here to our list and go through our logic, we've now used 3-phosphoglycerate and 2-phosphoglycerate. The only two things left are phosphoenopyruvate and pyruvate. Most people can remember that the end of glycolysis is pyruvate. We're not quite at the end, so phosphoenolpyruvate must be our second to last intermediate. So we'll write that up on the board. Phosphoenolpyruvate. Now, we had somewhat significant change here in that we went from a glycerate to a pyruvate. So what happened there? Well, if you compare the two structures, here's what happened. Notice that this first molecule, carbon number one, that stayed the same. Carbon number two has changed a little bit. We still have the uh, phosphate group on it, but we now have a double bond to carbon number two, and we had to get rid of that hydrogen right there. And then when we look at carbon three, it used to have an OH on it, and now it doesn't have any OH. This would just be three hydrogens on here, or two more hydrogens. So we lost a hydrogen in a hydroxyl group, and in fact, these got lost together to form this double bond right here. And when you put those together, you have water. And so what happened in this reaction is we lost water. So pyruvate is a form of dehydrated, I guess you could say glycerate. 
it's missing essentially a water molecule. And that's why we give it a new name of pyruvate. But it still has its phosphate group on it. In our very last step, I have room to show this on the board, we're going to create pyruvate. And this is our last significant step. So in pyruvate, when we just look at this name, and we ask ourselves what has happened here, well, we lost our phosphate group, right? Pyruvate, it's not phosphopyruvate, it's just pyruvate. That means that this phosphate got lost. Where did it go? Well, hopefully, like this last step, you might say, well, maybe we had some ADPs come in, and they received that phosphate, and we created some more ATP. And that would be exactly right. We had two ADPs. We're going to create two ATPs. And remember, we had two of these, two of these. We actually got two waters, two of these. So there were two of all of those up here. And we actually have two pyruvates that we form. But that's what we're doing. We're just going to remove this pyruvate. We end up breaking this double bond. And that's how we form pyruvate. And now we're really at the, at the end of our pathway. We've gone all the way from glucose to pyruvate. And we've explained at each step what's sort of been happening. And in red, we've drawn all the things that are coming into or out of the pathway. And we don't really have to memorize them. We just have to read it. So right here, where does the first phosphate occur? Well, where we went from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. I know that a phosphate occurred there. Fructose 6-phosphate to 1,6-bisphosphate, well, an ATP must have been given up. The one trick, here we went from bisphosphate to glyceraldehyde, so we know that's where the split was, that change in the chemical names. This one is both the most important and in some ways the hardest step to remember because there's so much going on. We know that we gained a phosphate, and we just have to remember that that came from that inorganic phosphate doing an attack. One of the ways to help me remember this is the oxidation state. Going from an aldehyde with two bonds to an 8, a glycerate with three bonds to oxygen. And so if, because that's an oxidation, then I'll remember that I have to have a reduction, and NAD plus is what I'm going to always use for a reduction. So the fact that the oxidation and reduction go hand in hand help me remember what's going on in that step. This step, I go from two phosphates, a bisphosphate, to a single phosphate. So there I can remember that ATP must be produced. Isomerase. This one, water's coming out. That's my name change from glycerate to pyruvate. And then I've got my final loss of phosphate. And so if I just read the intermediates, I can figure out where everything's coming in and out of the pathway. A few more things we want to add. As we go back, let's just do some enzyme, at least last names. This enzyme the, that catalyzes this reaction, it's involving ATP and phosphate transfers. So in green here, we'll write the enzyme names. This is a kinase. I don't need you to memorize the full name for this. Again, I'm not really trying to get you to memorize things. But you should know the last name of this enzyme, that it's called a kinase, because it does an ATP transfer. We already know this last name, isomerase. Right here, we have another ATP transfer. So this is a kinase. Now, this kinase, this one I actually am going to have you memorize. This one, is its full name is phosphofructo. kinase, or PFK. And the reason why I'm having you remember this one specifically is because this is the regulatory step of glycolysis. Regulatory step. So most of the enzymes in this pathway are not regulated. They just operate. They're always on. 
And if there's uh, intermediate or reactant, then they'll convert that to the next step in the pathway. But phosphofructokinase is a regulatory step, and it can be turned on or off. And it just so happens that it works by allosteric regulation. So we learned about that, what that was earlier. And it is actually a negative feedback inhibition pathway. So what happens is phosphofructokinase is regulated by levels of ATP. Remember, this pathway overall is trying to increase the ATP or the energy available for the cell. But we can actually have too much ATP. ATP is stable, but it will go bad. It's kind of like the bread that you buy at home. So at least when I buy a loaf of bread, if I'm not going to eat that within three or four days, if it goes much longer than that, the bread gets moldy and then I can't use it anymore. Same thing with ATP. It doesn't really get moldy, but it will only last for so long before it goes bad. So you want to get up to a certain level. You only want to buy one loaf of bread, use it, and then when the bread is low, you buy more. Same thing here. As ATP levels rise, the ATP that's produced in these reactions will come back and bind to the allosteric site of phosphofructokinase and shut the enzyme off so we don't make any more ATP. We also, coincidentally, won't burn this ATP, so we save ourselves some ATP by doing this. Now, when ATP levels get low, then ATP falls off of the allosteric side. It won't inhibit anymore, and we start to make more ATP. And so the level of ATP will control how much, or rather phosphofructokinase is on or not, and how much we continue glycolysis. So that's why we want you to know that one specifically. We're not going to worry about that enzyme. This enzyme, we can remember its last name because the reaction is involving NADH, and it removed a hydrogen from this species. So this enzyme is called a dehydrogenase. Over here, we have another ATP transfer. It's going in the opposite direction, but it's nonetheless an ATP transfer. And so this is a kinase, isomerase again, and then we're not going to worry about this one. And then over here, we have another kinase. So most of the enzymes in this pathway, there's a couple you don't need to know, we're not going to worry about, but uh, most of them are kinases, isomerases, and then we have one dehydrogenase that we want you to know. So that's overall the glycolysis pathway. Now that we've explained that a little bit, I am going to do an overview. So this was a detailed view of it. All right, so now that we've erased the board, let's go just over an overview of glycolysis. So glycolysis overview. And so let's look at, for the whole pathway, overall 10 steps or nine steps, what were our reactants? And then what were some of our products. Okay, well the first most obvious one is that our first reactant that started the whole thing was glucose. And then the glucose got converted into actually not one, but two pyruvates. Okay, we also saw that for our reactants, Remember, we had to invest some ATPs. In fact, we invested two ATPs, and then those became two ADPs. And then we also saw that at that glyceraldehyde step, we needed two inorganic phosphates. And those didn't 
really come out anywhere. And then we had to add in, we're going to put in here four ADPs. We had four ADPs, and we used those to make four ATPs. Additional products, we also had two waters that we produced along the pathway. And then we finally had two NAD pluses, and from those NAD pluses, we got two NADHs. So, at the end, a couple of important highlights. Here's our energy. Now, we got four ATPs total, but really, we had to burn eight, two ATPs to get that. So we take our four minus the two, so let's subtract those, and say that we got two ATPs net out of it. That's the energy. So we went through glycolysis. What did we get for it? Well, we got two ATPs. Another big deal are these NADHs. We're going to come back to these. We've got to do something with these NADHs. We can't just leave them as NADH. Now, if we're going to use oxygen and burn them in oxygen, they'll go on to the next pathway that we'll talk about next time, which is going to be the citric acid cycle. If we don't have oxygen, we have to somehow regenerate these. Because if we don't have more NAD+, plus, there's only so much NADH or NAD+, plus to go around. And if we don't regenerate it or somehow get new NAD+, plus, it will shut down. We'll have no more reactant and we'll shut down the whole pathway. So we're going to discuss this next. But we've got that problem and then we've got the 2 ATP net out of it. Most of our energy, though, it turns out that the if we take glucose, we can get a lot more energy out of it than ATP. Most of the energy is still locked up in these pyruvates. Uh, one more thing to discuss. The ATPs that we produced right here come from a special method of making ATP. There's two ways of making ATP. We call them substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. Glycolysis is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. We haven't learned what oxidative phosphorylation is. We'll learn that in a couple of days. But the ATPs that we generate in glycolysis are produced from substrate level phosphorylation, which simply means that some kind of substrate, like phosphoenolpyruvate or 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, are going to be the source of our phosphorylation. And so both in glycolysis, all of our ATP is generated from substrate level phosphorylation. Later on, we'll see where we can use oxidative phosphorylation to make even more ATP. The next thing I want to go over about this pathway is our pyruvate. So we have pyruvate at the end of the pathway. And if we just leave the pyruvate there, then the levels will start to build in the cell of pyruvate. And eventually they could get high enough that they would block the rest of the pathway. We get kind of a traffic jam. So we've got to get rid of our pyruvate and move it somewhere. Pyruvate has two possible fates. One of them involves oxygen. So if we have two O2 present, or we call this aerobic conditions, aerobic simply means that there's oxygen present, then we're going to go on to the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. 
which this one, this is where we're going to use our oxygen right here in electron transport. But we'll move the pyruvate through. In this pathway, we're going to release CO2. And this gives us a lot of energy. So this is the preferred way of doing it. However, there are certain conditions where we don't have oxygen. So if we have no O2, then we have to do what's called anaerobic conditions. So if there's no oxygen, and then sometimes you'll hear people call this hypoxic conditions, meaning that there's very low oxygen, still means that essentially the same thing. So what happens when we have no oxygen? Then we go through another route called fermentation. And the main function of fermentation are these later stats that's a very short pathway. It's not to produce ATP. It is to regenerate NADH or NAD+. Sorry. It's to regenerate NAD+. And so here's what happens to regenerate NAD+. There's actually two different methods of this. So pyruvate, in one method, turns into lactate. So in this method, really all we're doing is remember that NADH has that H right there with those extra electrons. And all we do in this method is we just take the H and the extra electrons and we dump it right back on, on pyruvate. So all lactate is is a hydrogenated form of pyruvate. We're just taking those hydrogens or that hydrogen with its electrons, throwing it back on, and that's how we create lactite. Super simple. Humans, or actually all mammals, and ma animals, all animals, are lactate fermenters. So this is how we do it. There are some microorganisms, though, that will do a two-step process. They take pyruvate, and the first thing they do is they lose one of the carbons on it to form CO2. So the first thing they do is release CO2, and they form a two-carbon intermediate called acetaldehyde. And then they take acetaldehyde, And now is when they take their NAD plus or NADH. So they take their NADH and do the same thing. They dump the electrons and hydrogens off on it, and then they form NAD plus. And so ethanol is nothing more but acetaldehyde that's been given a hydrogen atom and two electrons. And so we form ethanol from it. So either way you go, notice that the main purpose is to take our NADH that we created in glycolysis, turn it back into NADH, or sorry, into NAD+. And so that NAD+, will then go back into glycolysis so that we can keep our glycolysis running. And so that's the purpose of these steps. So again, you can either get rid of pyruvate through lactate fermentation or through ethanol fermentation is what the second one is called. Mammals are up here. We're lactate fermenters. And then uh, there's some microorganisms that are ethanol fermenters. And this actually ends up having a lot of commercial consequences. For example, notice um, 
Well, when, when you go to make bread, if you've ever made bread before, or cinnamon rolls or something, you're going to put yeast in it. So yeast is a microorganism. And in that bread, you've got some flour and some sugar in there. And when you let that bread rise, what's happening, the yeast in the bread are taking those sugars and things in the dough, and they're fermenting with them. So you cover them up, they're inside the bread, and so they don't have access to oxygen inside the dough. They're kind of smothered in there. So they start fermenting. They produce CO2 as a gas. This is what causes your bread to rise, is the formation of that carbon dioxide in it. You might wonder, if they're alcohol fermenters, are they also creating ethanol? Yeah, when that yeast is fermenting, the carbon dioxide is causing the bread to rise. It's also producing ethanol. And so if you eat a lot of, uh, I guess, raw bread dough, then you're eating ethanol. Uh, however, it doesn't really produce so much. You'd have to eat a lot of bread dough to really get a buzz off of it. In fact, you'd probably get really sick uh, before you'd actually get buzzed. <laughs> so it's not a really effective way of getting drunk. Uh, what about when you eat, uh, eat the cooked bread? When you bake the bread, um, you're not, all the alcohol uh, sort of evaporates off of that. So when you eat cooked bread, you're not having any ethanol. You are eating a lot of dead yeast, though. So commercially important in uh, the formation of bread and actually in alcoholic beverages. So in alcoholic beverages like beer and wine, they're taking advantage of this fermentation process. Again, you're adding yeast or a microorganism to the grape juice or to the malt. So the, the I guess, grain, you create this mash of grain that has sugars in it from the, uh, whether you use wheat or corn or agave plant. And so it's using that as a sugar source and the microorganisms are fermenting. You seal it in a barrel or a cask so that no oxygen gets in. They undergo, they're creating CO2, so that produces the fizz that you see in the wine or the beer. And then they're producing ethanol. And they'll often keep them doing this. They'll go through cycles of this to strengthen the alcohol content in that. But that's what they're using. So the process of fermentation actually is, is commercially pretty significant. With that, I think an overview, we've gone over glycolysis. We've gone over the steps of fermentation. We've talked about substrate level and oxidative level phosphorylation a little bit. We've done an overview of glycolysis. And we talked about aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Later on, when we come back in our next lecture video, we're going to be moving on the aerobic route and looking at the citric acid cycle and how we carry on this pathway. But that'll be it for now, so we'll see you next time.